Okay. All right. Um, Mason Frank, you can start. Right. Tony Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that um, we get to come together and um, learn about your word, that we learn about the Bible and theology today. Um, pray, please pray, pray that the conversations that we have will be pleasing to you and that we say nothing outside of your word, your will, Lord. And uh, just name pray. Amen. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to take a quick break. Well, you congratulate you. Put it on the gauge. Yeah. Congrats, that's awesome. Did you surprise her? Or did she know it was coming? I'm terrible at surprises. <laughs> <laughs> did she plan it for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> okay. um, all right, so so uh, Cal's gone this week, and um, I thought we could take a quick break from apologetics, because if I'm going to be honest, I think I've said this before, apologetics isn't quite my strong suit. <laughs> So, um, I, I really like systematic theology. So, we're going to do, um, we're gonna do a section of systematic theology today, um, the Doctrine of the Bible specifically. Uh, since we haven't done anything in theology yet, got some definitions, the fun stuff that we have to get through first. So, um, the difference between theology and apologetics is basically where you start. Um, apologetics doesn't start with any assumptions. So, they, well, there's one assumption. The one assumption they start with is that truth is knowable, right? Which we all kind of already agree on that. Um, great place to start uh, getting into theology. But um, theology is going to be the practical side of Christianity. We're going to take two more assumptions, that truth is knowable, that the Bible is true, and then the God of the Bible is who he says he is, right? Because if the Bible is true and God could lie, then we have other things we can get into as well. So those are going to be our main um, assumptions, and we all agree with those, right? The second part about systematic theology is that um, there, there are right answers to it, whereas in apologetics, it's very speculative, right? We can argue with, kind of, with uh, deductive reasoning and some inductive reasoning in there. Um, but in systematic theology, it can all be deductive, because we can go back to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. So if we have disagreements in here, I highly encourage them. I really like discussion, if we can get some going. Um, we have to remember that the Bible is the source of our truth, and we're going to go back to the Bible to argue, right? So if you have a point you want to come after me with, I encourage it, but just make sure you have your verses ready, because <laughs> I'm going to have my verses ready, right? So um, then we're going to get into our first doctrine, which is the doctrine of the Bible. So systematic theology is the study of what the entire Bible has to say about individual topics. Um, so an example right now is, is the Bible. So instead of like New Testament theology or Old Testament theology, which would just focus on the Old and New Testament, right, or um, hermeneutics uh, specifically focuses in on language and how language plays out in the Bible. Uh, systematic theology takes the Bible as a whole, right? So if we're going to do the doctrine of prayer, we're going to look at the Old Testament, the New Testament, and all what it has to say about prayer. Uh, Pastor Ben's sermon this morning was actually a systematic theology um, sermon. I thought it was excellent, but uh, you could tell he was jumping between the Old and the New Testament and finding different um, uh, reasons for, <laughs> um, for prayer. So, um, so, before we get started, there, this, like I said, is a very practical um, doctrine. There's a lot we can get out of it, hopefully, that you haven't learned before. I know a lot of you guys have already studied this before. Um, hopefully, there'll be a little tidbit or two that you can take. But uh, it's a really fun one for me. So some questions that I want us to be thinking about as we go through it is, um, how is the Bible in, uh, important, or how important is the Bible? Um, how often should we read our Bible? That's actually something that people disagree on a lot, and hopefully we can get to the bottom of that here. And specifically, should we worry about legalism when we're reading our Bible, right? Should we worry about doing it for the sake of doing it? Or, um, like, you know, doing it for work, so we can never get something out of it? Or should we just do it every single day anyway, you know? Um, and then we got to ask, too, how much should we actually know about the Bible before we get into it? So uh, there's some very core stories that are in the Bible that I think that we oftentimes haven't even read ourselves or have really thought about ourselves, right? So I think a good example of this is the fall of the angels. So, just briefly, the fall of the angel story kind of goes like um, Satan was up in heaven and he had a falling out of God where having a bunch of demons kind of came together. God throws them out of heaven. They go somewhere to hell, either on earth, and then um, Satan decides that he wants to go take over earth at that point and he goes into the body of a snake.
snake, or he turns himself into a snake, the sea is heaved, earth falls into his, his dominion, and now he rules over earth with all the demons until Jesus dies on the cross. Right? Um, has everyone kind of heard that story before? Does anyone actually know where that is in the Bible? Genesis. Genesis? And you know what Isaiah, right? Isaiah? It's actually a trick question. It's not in the Bible at all. Um, I actually just gave you a story from Paradise Lost by John Milton. It's written in 1650. It's fiction. Um, it's a great story, but not in the Bible at all. I, I learned this like a year or two ago. I just thought that was in the Bible um, because people take from Genesis and um, you're pointing to Isaiah. I think Is, Isaiah or Jeremiah is one of those two words. There's temptation of Eve. Sure, there's temptation of Eve. Um, and uh, Adam in Genesis. Right, so that's actually why this story is so convincing to us. Um, and what you're talking about, I think, is the fall of Satan, right? It sounds like yeah. the Satan fell from heaven, right? So those are the verses that we actually have. So we have Satan falling from heaven, and we have the temptation of Adam and Eve. Other than that, we have no idea what happened, and uh, specifically the fall. So. A lot of people think that Satan is just like a, he is like the most important devil, but maybe there's even different factions of demons, maybe they don't all agree, and all this is speculative. And unfortunately, we get a lot of theology from a fiction book. So just to tell you how fiction it is, I'm reading it right now, I'm almost done. Um, Eve, in the story, uh, is the only one that falls for the, the, the apple, and she like, Del goes by herself and Satan convinces her of it. Satan's actually a good guy in the entire story. Um, and she eats at it, brings it to Adam, and Adam's like, whoa, you idiot, you just ate that, but I love you so much, I'm also going to die for you. Like, <laughs> so he eats the apple and they both die, right? So it's not, it's not true, it's a fiction story. So. Um, so the Bible is very important, as I say, and we should really make sure we go back to the Bible for our foundation instead of books like Paradise Lost. It's an excellent book, and I encourage everyone to read that, but it's fiction. Um, another more maybe practical example of that is um, how many of you have been with friends or people that you know that will pray over you and say, um, you know, God will heal you right here if you have enough faith. If you ever had that, I've had that friends come to me and say that. Do you guys know how many times in the Bible someone had not been healed because of the faith of the person that was going to be healed? Mm -hmm. Actually, zero. Not one time in the entire Bible does that happen, right? Um, people weren't able to be healed based on the person that was trying to do the healing, right? The apostles mm -hmm. specifically. But, I mean, that is widespread in the American church. Where people will pray for someone. And they get it from a verse that they say that uh, if you don't ask in faith, you won't get it at all. But that's taken wildly out of context. It's specifically talking about wisdom and wisdom alone. So, the Bible is very, very, very important. And uh, we're going to start picking it apart and get into uh, different uh, attributes of the Bible. And hopefully we can um, get a good foundation for, for something that we can all agree on in the church. Because this is not controversial stuff. 90% uh, of the church, actually even the Catholic Church would, would agree with most of this. So, um, does anyone have any questions on that before we move on? No? Cool. Um, would you mind turning to 2 Peter 3.16, like maybe 1 Corinthians 2.14? Um, so in systematic theology, it's very systematic, as you can tell from the word, we um, take different doctrines, in this sense the doctrine of the Bible, and then we'll often look at different attributes of that thing we're studying. So, um, if you've ever heard about the, the attributes of God, like God's omniscience or his omnipotence, um, that's systematic theology, and they're breaking it down to the attributes so we can truly understand who God is. We do the same thing with the Bible. The first attribute that we're going to go through is the attribute of authority. So, um, the definition of authority is to believe one word of scripture is to disbelieve God. Um, I'm going to read to you 2 Timothy 3.16, so we can prove it. Another thing about systematic theology and why some people think it's boring is that since that we're taking this first assumption that the Bible is true, um, everything we get in systematic theology has to come from the Bible, right? So we're going to go through proof text, and like I said, if anyone disagrees with me, feel free to argue as much as you want, as long as it's in good faith, <laughs> and, um, and hopefully we can learn from it. But we're going to go back to the Bible for it. So, um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. So, um, there's a very, a very important word there, which is inspired. Does anyone know what inspired means when we're talking about the Bible? Does it mean that God actually wrote the Bible? comes directly from God. Perfect. comes directly from God. So does that mean that God told them what to write? 
No? No, right? So it doesn't actually deny the personality of the writer. It just says that it ultimately came from God. So, for example, we, when we read Luke and Matthew, we kind of went through this. We had different genealogies, and it seems like they were both writing the Gospels for, or the Gospel from a different perspective, and they were trying to tell different things. If God actually came to them and told them exactly what to say, we wouldn't get this variation between writing style, like uh, Isaiah is one, one of the most beautiful books written in the Bible that's very poetic, and then you have books like um, like Luke that are just like accounts. You know, it's like this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, right? So the key for the word inspired is it's not actually God telling them the exact words to write down. It's more of the idea behind it, right? So it's inspired in that it comes from God, but it doesn't deny the personality of the writer. So but ultimately, God is the, the author, okay? So that's, that's a small distinction here, okay? So it's inspired by God, which makes him the ultimate author, but it doesn't mean that he is, that it denies the personality of the writers. So this comes into our first practical application of this. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, for, for the longest time in church history, uh, the Roman Catholics would do all their sermons in Latin. Do you know when they stopped doing that? 60s. 60s, so not even that long ago. Vatican, um, Vatican II. Vatican II. Yeah. Um, and uh, Islam still does all of their stuff in, um, or in uh, Arabic. 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 And you can't translate the Quran into any other language. Um, the main reason for that is uh, Muhammad got an actual word from God and wrote it down, which means the moment he wrote it down, that was the word from God. That's what they claim. Um, we don't have that. Right? In Christianity, we don't say that God actually told them to write down these exact words. It was inspired by God. That's much different than them telling you the exact words. So for us, translations are not an issue. We shouldn't need to just preach in Latin the entire time. Right? We can translate the Bible to any language we want, as long as we can keep it as true to the original documents that we have as possible. All right? Does that make sense? So would that be, so the way I think about it, that it was the authors were spirit-led. Yeah, where God's right. spirit was, and within that is your also your personality. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean it's fallible, but yeah, the, um, the the other word that's used is God breathed. So, yeah, um, yeah for sure. Uh, also, then those uh, what's the King James only at least that you guys I'm sure you've heard of those, right? So that's the direct contradiction to what we have here. So um, there's no, there are translations are better than the others, like my mom's. Some, sometimes a word can make a big difference, though. So. Sure, so I was just about to get into that. So you have like the message, which is like some one guy's translation of the Bible. Um, there's a lot, I've actually taken my, my favorite versions of NRSV and compared the two, and the words that he uses are just contrary to the ones that are in the NRSV. So, the translation is still very important, right? I'm just saying that it is possible to do it correctly. Um, whereas, like for the for the Muslim faith, um, it's not possible to do it correctly because this is the actual word of God. Um, I'm trying to think. So, so a lot of people would argue that NIV is an okay version. I think most theologians would say that. They would say that better English versions would be um, NRSV and ESV specifically. That seems to be the one that people really like. Um, and the reason those are big deals, is that they are very literal translations of the oldest documents that we have. It's so like we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and these sorts of things, and there's wide consensus among scholars, right? Um, and we also know that these translations are not very far off, because we have had many, many translations, starting from about the Reformation. Um, what did we be the first guy that translated it to English? I don't remember. I'm not sure. Yeah, one of those guys. But either way, after that until today, um, we can trace many of those translations right back to the original text. And uh, there was actually then zero major doctrine changes in all of Christianity, which is fascinating, and um, a serious argument for the truth of Christianity. Um, Mormons had about 3,000, and they've been around for about 200 years. So that shows you something. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so then how about Paul, right? Because the if we're going to say that the, the scripture of God read, we have to go to, well, who did, who did he give this authority to, right? Um, if we see Moses, we talked about this last week, whenever scripture was actually written, um, it, came with, it came with massive amounts of sign and proof that this was new doctrine coming, 
right? So Moses was splitting the Red Sea. He's sending the plagues himself personally. He could have hit the rock. And he even would act contrary to God's will. God told him to speak to the rock and water would come out. And he struck it, or struck it, and then water still came out anyway. So there's something going on with Moses. And the idea behind it is he was bringing new doctrine. We see that also with Elijah and Elisha. Um, we see that with a lot of the prophets and specifically the apostles. Um, the one major problem we have with this is Paul. Right? So Paul isn't one of the 12 disciples. He does say he's an apostle. But why is his writing considered scripture? So if we read 2 Peter 3.16, this is Peter writing, who is an apostle, an apostle who could do the signs and wonders, and um, was clearly speaking the word of God uh, for multiple reasons we're not going to get into right now. So right. if we read that. I'm going to go into 15 just a second. Sure. Just, uh, context. Context. Yeah. Yeah. just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Okay. So do you know what the key point is there for Paul? What is it? that he's writing, his writing is the same as other scriptures. Other scriptures, yeah. yeah. So if you notice right at the end, uh, Peter says they twist Paul's writings as they do the other scriptures, which is referring to the Old Testament. So uh, Peter, who is an apostle, apostle uh, took Paul's writings and elevated them to scripture. So for that reason, we do the same, all right? Um, there's, I, I mean, we could do an entire summer just talking about this topic. I actually think uh, Pastor Ben is doing one of these if you're interested in it. Um, coming up in a few weeks, the, um, the authority of scripture is, is what I think he's teaching on. Um, but for the last point here, with the authority of the Bible, um, we have to also remember that comprehending the actual word of God comes as a gift from God himself, right? We shouldn't expect non-Christians to understand scripture in the way we do because the Bible actually claims that. So, um, and then another point about scripture, um, first of all, is that we can't believe scripture half-heartedly because of the first part, that scripture itself claims to be the inherent word of God. So once we believe in any of scripture, we have to believe it all comes from God, because that's what it claims, right? So if we turn to 1 Corinthians 2.14, can we read that down? The natural person <clears throat> does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah, so there's uh, two important points we can pull from that verse. The first is that um, if we can't understand the Bible, God wants us to understand the Bible, right? So we can pray. We can get understanding from that. That should be really encouraging to us. If we're not understanding something, the first thing we should do is pray, and then we also have elders and leaders and churches that we can go to to learn from. But, um, and then the second part of that is that from the non-Christian, we probably shouldn't add too much emphasis to what they're teaching. Right, because they are immediately at a huge disadvantage to speak from the Bible as a comparative Christian. Right? Um, he, that, I've heard this argument for even people like Rabbi Zacharias. If you guys heard, he was a, a great uh, preacher in America, and he had hor he did horrible things, and, uh, sex um, scandals all throughout his life, which should make us question the integrity of his salvation. Right? The Bible's pretty clear about we're seen by our fruits. So that should also make us question his teaching, unfortunately. Um, I've also heard these sorts of things apply to many pastors, so uh, take it with a grain of salt, of course. This is my perspective there. But um, yeah, you sometimes you hear about. stories of pastors who have been preaching from the pulpit for 20 years, yeah. and they have a conversion to faith yeah. after yeah. that. Yeah. You uh -huh. know, and yet, yeah. Man, you know, so it's possible. Right, yeah. So, um, yeah, and it, it's not our, the Bible, uh, people think, like to point out when it says, do not judge. Um, the Bible is actually pretty clear about judging Christians. We should be judging Christians yeah. frequently. Um, but it's not our job to say whether people are saved or not. The Bible is pretty clear about that as well. So don't, don't go looking under a rock and accusing people of not being saved so you don't have to listen to their, their teaching as well. Right? So, so find balance, uh, also spiritually discerned. So we should be yeah. praying for these things. Any questions on authority? I was kind of, there's a lot of it right now, so I went through it really quickly. Um, comments, questions? I think that spiritually discerned is really like, um, it's so important for us individually as we read God's word and as we try to learn truth, we, <clears throat> we balance that with what people say. You can right. compare that to see if there's any contradictions and you know, your confidence in what other people are saying 
are based on what you believe you're convicted to believe what the Bible all right. says. So you're also hitting on one of my first questions that I asked in the start of the class is how frequently should we be reading our Bible, right? Yeah. So that, starting, starting to get to the answer of that question as we get in here. Um, what time does this end? Does it end at 12 or 12.15? 12. 12. Soon? 12. 12. Cool. You can go a little faster then. Um, so the next attribute of the Bible is necessity. Um, the definition of this attribute is that the Bible is necessary to know the gospel, God's will, how to live, and how to live your life but it's not necessary to know that God exists. Um, this is a really important one, all right? And it's one that's missed frequently in the church, I think, today. And um, there are different views that I think are quite harmful uh, as well. And um, we're gonna get into it. The, I think before we start getting into those views, um, I'm a pretty big believer that there is healthy disagreement in the church, um, especially between like us and the Reformed traditions, like, uh, and there's plenty of Reformed right here, um, even us and some of the um, and some of the doctrines of the Charismatics, I believe that there's a lot of wiggle room there. These heresies I'm going to get into here are widely agreed on in church. All right, most denominations would agree with what I'm about to say. Doesn't mean everyone would. Okay. Um, all right. So before we get started, I'm going to turn to Romans 10:13 through 17. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Romans. says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one on, or how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear with, um, without someone proclaiming him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the news or are the feet who bring the good news? Um, but not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Um, this is a very, very important verse when we're studying Bible. Notice that Paul explicitly says that saving faith, becoming justified, comes from hearing the gospel, and no one can be saved without the Bible. All right. We talked about this a little bit last week, but an increasing um, doctrine that's creeping up in the church today is um, what we call inclusivism. All right. Um, this is an, I actually used the slides when I taught a class last week, so I'm going to go through this a little quickly. Or last year I taught a class at, with the high schoolers, and, and I taught systematic theology. So I know we already talked about these. Universalism, that's one that Oprah Winfrey believes that everyone gets to go to heaven, right? Um, pluralism is the idea that there's multiple ways to heaven. So you could go to heaven through Islam, exclusively believing in Islam and also go to heaven through Christianity, but there also might be some ways where you can't go to heaven, maybe if you're an atheist or something like that. Um, inclusivism is even more restrictive than that. We say that maybe there's like a second chance that you could get to heaven. Um, and then annihilationism is the view that once you die, you, are, you don't go to hell, you're just immediately, uh, you just disappear, right? These two, uh, annihilationism and inclusivism, excuse me, have really um, started to creep back into the church. While these aren't like absolute heresies, um, there have been people in our church that have believed it. I've, I've known that, I've talked to some. Um, so we're not gonna like kick them out of the church and say, no, I'm a Christian or anything like that. I believe for these reasons here, they can be a little harmful if they're wrong, right? They have arguments where they think that they're right. Um, we're gonna get into that on the next slide. Um, and then the last point about that verse that we need to recognize is that the Bible is necessary for maintaining spiritual life. Um, it's not just that we should read our Bible to understand what we should do or something like that. If we want to know how to continue to grow and become like Christ, we have to be reading our Bible. So it's the source for everything. Um, does anyone have questions on those? I know I went through those quickly, but we got more here. Oh, um, Matthew 4.4 4 says, Jesus of this, as it is written, my man, her man shall not live on bread alone, but on the, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? Definitely need our Bibles. Um, okay. Any questions? Nope. All right. Special revelation and general revelation. So this would be the two ways that we can learn about God. Uh, does anyone have any guesses on the difference between special and general revelation? Have you ever heard of that? How about this? How do you guys think that God can speak to us or show himself today? Does anyone know? How about the Bible? 
right? There's one. You can read a Bible and God helps us out. Can you guys think of anything else? Have you ever been outside the Bible where you think that God can make you exist? We were kind of talking about I think about there's it. a lot of ways in that he opens and closes you know, through our prayers, of answering our prayers, and mm -hmm. opening and closing doors. Sure. That you, and then there's this um, filling um, the actual relationship with the Holy Spirit. Right. And there, there's a being guided by the Holy Spirit. You know that those are a little bit harder to define sometimes. Yeah. But it's, um, but I think that's. It's real. It, yeah, and it talks. It clearly talks about that in the Bible. Okay, so so you just nailed on special revelation. All right, special revelation is God uh, directly interacting with, with humans. Okay, so that would be something like sanctification, or right? so walk with Christ. Um, it's going to be the Bible. It's a, the biggest example. Like God wrote the Bible and He gave it to us, so we can see God's will there. Um, but how about general revelation? Does God reveal Himself in anything else besides the Bible or direct intervention in our life? Through nature. Through nature. Yeah. Exactly. So general revelation is the idea that God has created this amazing universe, and there's so many laws, like Troyes and we were just talking about today, is that um, you can see God through the laws of nature. So there's plenty of very solid arguments that would suggest that there has to be one omnipotent, all-powerful God, right? Um, and the Bible, spe or, uh, specifically in Psalms, it talks about how when you look up at the stars and you see the majesty and how amazing it is, how we can see God's handiwork there, right? So um, let's start to break those down a little bit more. Uh, for special revelation, I'm going to turn to um, John 1, 5, 3. Or first John 5, 3. That I have one. It. Oh, you have it? Why don't you go for it? Yeah. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Perfect. So this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Um, something else when we start to study the Bible, or at least I have, significantly, I, I really got into this about two years ago, was that the Bible talks about things that I thought it talked about a whole lot less than it does. It talks about a lot of other things more. Right? <laughs> this is one of them. It says, the love of God is obeying his commandments. That was something that kind of blew my mind. Whoops. I thought that was legalism. I thought that we're not supposed to do things in order to gain the love of God, which is granted not what this is saying. But it's saying in order for us to show our love to God, we follow his commandments. Um, I like that ending of it too. It says it's not burdensome. It's not burdensome. So that's no. the difference between doing our work. Because oh. you hear people saying things like, you know, I, I slave to death at church and no one appreciates me. That's a lot different than obeying God if that's not burdensome, which is the heart of you who wants to serve him and enjoys doing something for him. Right. And it doesn't feel happy. Right, you're right. Yeah, you're right on. Mm -hmm. um, you got too much love. <laughs> too much love. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, because um, because it's not right when it's when it's our ultimate will to follow God. We're not doing this out to gain anything. Um, Pastor John's last sermon series was on this point, so I think we all remember that, right? That we do this because we love God. We don't do this to gain love from God. Um, also, this is I think this is amazing because this gives us one of our main reasons to live. I mean, it's very explicit right here. It's how do we love God, so we obey and keep his commandments. So I think like one of the most BA verses in all the Bible is Ecclesiastes 12, 13. It's like just my favorite. It's um, so Solomon is writing Ecclesiastes and he's very depressed and saying how he went through all the world looking for meaning. He gets to the very end right here and he says, uh, fear God and keep his commandments for this is a full duty of man. And what he's saying is that there's nothing left for us except for this one thing that will actually bring us joy and purpose. So how do we know what the duty of God is, or the duty for us to do, um, is to read the Bible, right? Special revelation. Very important for us to get back into the Bible, learn the will of God. Um, then we also have general revelation. I realize I didn't put any verses here, but this is talking about the verses I talked about before. You don't have to just believe me, or you can Google it. <laughs> Double check. It's um, talking about how uh, we can we can see God in creation. Let me just look at Romans one nineteen. I think that might be it. Is that it? I think it is. Okay. Does anyone have that? I can read it to you. You do? Can you read it for us? For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Nice. Yeah, so that's exactly what we're talking about, right? So many people have said that it would be unfair for God to send the unbeliever to hell without him making himself known. Right? It's one of the strongest arguments against Christianity. Um, I just finished reading um, The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. It's a really sad book. It's very harsh against Christians. He's trying to argue why Christianity is wrong. That's one of his main arguments, right? Um, that and the problem of evil. The Bible is pretty clear that God has made himself known. It's every time you walk outside and see the beauty of creation, um, you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics not to get to a God, right? Maybe not the Christian God, but at least a God. And um, God holds you responsible for that, unfortunately. Um, and uh, not unfortunately, justly, he does. And the laws of nature, the laws of the human body, and the, there's an yeah. order that is that's just too big right. to be um, by chance. And even, isn't it like atheists say there's like that, like law, that why does man seek a God? There's right, within natural us law, also. that's what's, yeah. so let's call it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, me and Cal, I'm very excited to do this. We're going to do a uh, session for a couple weeks on the assumptions of science. So we often think about science as being true and needing to be true, but there's serious assumptions that we take on science that are on faith to faith alone. So um, it's very interesting that Francis Bacon, who created the scientific method, was an avid Christian, and he took these assumptions he found in the Bible and said, if these are true, then I can create this system to learn more about God, and it's the reason he created it. Um, one of them, like you were saying, is uniformity. There's no reason why things should be constant in the world, but they are. Like, we say we can observe things, and they can, we can observe them over and over and over again, like gravity. If I take this, I just drop it. You guys know if I drop this, it's going to fall on the ground, right? Like that. Will it, though? Oh, well, that's actually a really good question. Like, why? And why will it do it the next time, right? Does it every single time. Um, these are the sorts of things where we can start to find God in the world. He's written his name on the universe. Um, and he says that that's enough to know who he is, and we have to take it at that. Um, this is also why it's very important that we do not, if inclusivism and annihilationism are wrong, um, which these verses tend to be leaning towards, it's very dangerous that we don't fall into that because that would give unbelievers false hope that, um, that they can get to God in another way, right? And unfortunately, well not unfortunately, justly, right? The Bible seems to say it's only through Jesus Christ and it's through hearing his word. Um, you also read at the very end there that, um, that it said that their thoughts will sometimes excuse them. Um, some people have taken that to say that the unbeliever, when they, um, that their thoughts, even as they, as natural law, they kind of have this inward feeling that they need to do good, and if they follow that, that they will be excused from hell. Um, that's not what that verse is saying. It's, it's, what it's saying is that if you continue in sin long enough, you can subvert natural law, and that you can become um, okay with sinning. Right? But the idea is that that's practice, and you have to actively reject God to do it. He has written it on your heart to not sin. Um, so that's just a quick note. I'd like to get into that more maybe eventually. But um, that's something that is coming up more in the church today, for sure. Um, so Romans 2, 14 through 15. I got that here. It says this. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law themselves, are a law to themselves. They show what the law, what they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, um, to which their own consciousness also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them. So this is another verse that they'll point to. Um, as you can see, as I just read it, it seems to be saying that they will excuse themselves from doing the good there. Um, all right. So any questions of necessity, disagreements? No. Nope. All right, we're going to get into sufficiency. Um, so, so this is a very this attribute is very dear to me personally, um, and that uh, I really struggled with this one before I started studying um, theology. That I didn't understand that the Bible was sufficient, and uh, that had some negative consequences in my life um, from how I viewed God. So. The attribute of sufficiency is saying that the scripture contains all the words of God uh, needed for salvation and to obey him. Um, 
This specifically is not talking about inclinations of the spirit. That's what the Reformed would call this. Have you guys like, ever prayed and felt like God maybe gave you an impression to read the Bible or maybe to do something good rather than wrong? Um, they would claim that that's not this, all right? Many people would say it suggests that God uh, can talk to you, uh, that when you, God will actually speak to you and you can understand him, you can hear him if you pray. The sufficiency of the Bible suggests that that isn't the case, that God has already told us everything he needs to tell us in the Bible, all right? Um, but as I said before, this is not like answers to prayer, right? Like we pray, um, God, you know, I'm having a struggle in this life, and maybe he brings a verse to your mind, right? This is, this is different from that. I'm talking about new doctrine, right? Um, does anyone have James 1.18? Pull it up, too. I'm sorry? Hmm? No. You, know what I'm you have it. Sam has oh, Sam has it. it. Yeah. I should have bought it. I checked it over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Okay. So um, this verse is, is often overlooked as well because it's not directly talking about the sufficiency of the Bible. But um, if you notice, it says that it'll come from the Word and not anything else, right? Just the Word. So the Bible is sufficient. It's not the Bible and human experience. It's not the Bible and, you know, trying to get the Word from God coming out from heaven. He's already given it to us. It's in the Bible. It's sufficient. Everything that we need to be good Christians and to love God efficiently or effectively comes from the Bible. Um, it's very important that we don't look anywhere else because these subjective impressions that we get, while not useless, because it could be the Holy Spirit, it's possible, um, but there's no way to know. All right? um, throughout human history, there have been terrible, terrible, terrible acts of crime that have happened based on this idea. Right? Um, the Catholic faith says that the Pope can get these as well. I mean, all their crusades came from this doctrine, saying that they got a word from God, saying that they need to go kill other Christians and get back this piece of land in Israel, that really doesn't matter, right? So it's very important that we check what people say with the Bible, and if it's contrary, the Bible trumps all, everything. The Bible is the, the key foundation to Christianity. Can I um, bring up one area where I see, um, we, I don't, not in our churches so much, mm -hmm. but in Christianity in America, you'll hear people say, I, I, got a, I had a word for you. Right, that's what I'm talking about. That, yeah, it's a little concerning because you can't, like, sometimes they'll be like, you, I got a word for me last, like, I was praying last night, I got a word for you, and I think you should move to Texas and get a job there. And people will do those things, because, right. but if you're, I believe, if we're led in our reading, and our prayer life, you know, um, that the Lord would put that on your own heart, that someone else can't speak that to you, you shouldn't just take that as the word of God, right? right? You have to weigh it, and pray over it, and read scripture, and know. Yeah. It's true for you or not. Yeah, our church would respond to that, that since that we're in the dispensation of grace, that that doesn't happen anymore. So whenever someone says that, we pretty much straight away say that listen from God. Right. Um, I think it's not yeah. as big a deal in our churches. Actually, right. I, I think we have to remember that the Word of God is living and active. Is any two edged sword mm -hmm. can, can cut between the bone and the marrow. Yeah. And, and, I belonged to the Gideons at one time, mm -hmm. and we handed out scripture, mm -hmm. and I heard the testimony of several people where they were in another country and handed out Bibles, mm -hmm. and one guy came to salvation just through a piece of the Bible that had been torn out and tossed on the ground wow. and that he picked up and read. Cool. And it ended up accepting the Lord just from that small portion wow. of the New Testament. So mm -hmm. we just have to re we do have to remember that God is powerful, and He, if someone seeks Him, God will find a way to bring that person to knowledge of of His Son, whether it's through one of us or through His Word, right? That gets to them somehow. So, yeah, I think you, you have two great points there. The first is that the sufficiency of the Bible is right there, attested to in that story, right? You came to salvation from the Bible, right? You don't need anything else to have that. Second point is we often forget about the sovereignty of God. If you are truly seeking God and it's God's will that you become saved, um, I sounded pretty reformed there, but I'm <laughs> taking that from Romans 5, um, that would 
suggest that God can do whatever he wants, right? So um, maybe we don't need to think that we're all that all the time. And, and there's a little bit more. of nuance, I think, within there where I, it, where I think there's times when God will give us thoughts, strong feelings, dreams, sure. not even necessarily yeah. to where, but it's not like that becomes the absolute truth. Right. Like you almost could just get amazed by the process. It's like you're praying for someone and then you you had a dream that had that was connected with that and then God answered it in that same way. It's not so much that anything was special through me. It's kind of like, wow, God. That's, yeah, God just, that. that's just amazing. And you kind of open the door a little bit. So it really, it you don't really leave that that space where God's word is the foundation of everything. Right. And what right. you're talking about, when I start, when you start getting away from that, and start holding that as the same value as the Bible, that's when everything starts falling apart. Yeah. So, so when I also said in the beginning, great point. I'm actually that's my next point too here too. So I'll show some verses that support that thought. Um, at the beginning is that we get so much of our doctrine from what people say, and in reality, we outsource what we think like 90 percent. Right? We just don't have time to go in and dig ourselves. For the Bible, if it's the source of our truth, we really need to read it ourselves. Um, so, so specifically on this one, like where I said, people will pray over someone and then say, you were not saved based on your faith. It's nowhere in the Bible, right? It's just not there. So we shouldn't believe that. Um, the Bible, even though it's not explicit, we can look at examples of where this took place. Acts 16, 6 through 7 says this. Um, they went through the region of Phygia, Phygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak a word in Asia. But when they came opposite of Myasia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So if you notice here, oh shoot, I just turned off my, my uh, computer on accident. <laughs> so, so there, <laughs> um, so in that verse, we notice that there wasn't any new doctrine given, right? There wasn't, um, they, there wasn't like uh, the word from God saying you need to go directly to Texas, right? It actually um, lined up with Scripture, or reminds us of Scripture. So when when I say that when I pray for understanding, verses come to my mind. I give that example because that's something that happens to me frequently, um, and that I, I feel like that's from God. I don't know if it's from God, and I'll never claim it came from God because I don't know that for sure. But it seems to be consistent with the Bible, and it always brings me back to the source of truth, which is the Bible. So, um, yeah, that, I already got to that point. We should not, mis when people say they hear God, there's been many, many mistakes in the church. Um, oh, another very encouraging point is this is directly correlated with sanctification. So as we become more sanctified and like Christ, this will get better. And we will get better at this. So, um, something we can look forward to. Uh, this is clarity. I think I'm going to skip over this one. Um, we already talked about that verse in Peter that you read. Um, if you notice in that verse, not only does it say, as they twist it, they do the other scriptures, um, Peter says that the, the Bible can be hard to understand. Um, but he doesn't say, give that as an excuse to not understand it. Right? That's the key difference, is that you're still held responsible to understand it, um, but at the same time it can be difficult. And the solution to that is pray. I need to pray, understand this, become sanctified. In Deuteronomy, if you don't believe me, you can turn to yourselves, but in 6, six or 7, says we should ponder scripture at all times. It should be on our, on our mind. You know, what, what real practical, that has such an impact in my life is that when I was, I grew up as a teenager and we would preach in church and it was a very um, doctrine driven church to where I knew the Bible. Uh, compared to other teenagers really well mm -hmm. but yet I would read the Bible and it just at times would be dry would we, like it and then it became a part where I felt guilty if I didn't read the Bible right and so now you have this guilt and now there's there's some legalism tied into that it really wasn't until my early 40s that this whole concept of you can't love God anymore um, it, can't love God. God can't love God can't love God can't love anymore. <laughs> can't love God anymore. Work anymore. Yeah. And then that shift right there changed it to where, like, if I don't read my Bible today, there's just no guilt. It's like all I've done is I've missed the opportunity to get closer to the Lord. So then my prayer started changing to where it was like, Lord, reveal yourself. And, and it, 
reveal yourself to me through your word. And it's like a detective show where everything on the board and they're putting all the evidence. It's like, oh, here's a story about God's judgment and his harshness and his consistency. Here's his love. Here's his grace. Here's your, you know, you're kind of like, you're starting to see this complicated vision or, or, or uh, um, understanding of God that that you never, that you have to see that through the entire Bible. Yeah. That's when it became actually fun. And then instead of the guilt of not reading it, it became, it comes more like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, and that, that took me a while, you know, 20, 30 years of, of getting to that point, but that's, that's been probably the most um, productive spiritual time in my life is when I can do that. So, yeah, a couple notes on that and your stories here. First of all, when people give anecdotal stories, we should always compare them to the Bible and see if they, if they line up. Fortunately, in this class, every story that someone showed so far, it directly correlates, right? So for you, let's get into the practical reason of why that is the case um, right now, because you're 100% right. Um, first of all, we all know that the actual salvation comes from a relationship with God. Um, but I don't think we actually end up asking that step as how do we do that. We know our duty is to love and follow God's will, but um, how do we talk to God? If it's a relationship, we have to be able to communicate with him. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? We, we pray and we get to talk to God. But how does God talk to us? We don't believe that God is in our ear talking to us or anything like that. If he is, maybe we should go get some help because he shouldn't be here, God, in your ear. Um, so, so where is it? Through his word. It's through his word, right? So if you want to have a relationship with God, and this is the most important thing to your life, um, you need to listen to God, too. That only comes from reading the Bible. It's just not an act of legalism to read um, If you, like you were saying, you can get me dry when it becomes, I need to do this to do the right thing. If you think about it as, I love God, God loves me, and I want to communicate with God, the only way we're going to hear God's will and know what he wants for us and how to evangelize to others is through his work, right? Um, just... It just gives me such an appreciation for the Bible, too. It's, it's really the, the most important piece of anything that we have on this earth, right? It's a real tangible something that we can learn to love God from. It's quite amazing. So, um, yeah, that's it. I know you guys have kids, so you can get... Sounds like the door's open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Is that your kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thanks for coming today, guys. Hopefully we were able to get something out of that. Thanks, Yeah, Thanks,